Um, we're, we're excited this morning that Dr. Kim Cape, who is the General Secretary at GBHEM, will be talking with us about the Young Clergy Initiative. But before that starts, I need to talk with you about a tool that we're going to use to gather some information from you today. It is called, it's a tool called Poll Everywhere. It's an online tool for gathering information. You can use your cell phones to text, to access the web on your web browser, on your phone, or to tweet. So we're going to ask, during this time, we're going to be asking you some questions and seeking feedback from you. And I know there is not wireless in this room. And for us to have provided that for you would have really literally cost eight to $10,000. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. But this works with your cell phones. It works with te texting. You can go to the web browser on your phone. Or you can tweet. And I'm going to show you how, to, how you can do this. And I will also say, if you don't want to participate in this poll by using your cell phone, you can write your answers down on a sheet of paper. And we will accept your answers at the end of the session, too, because we really do want to gather some information today from you. So if you take out your cell phones, and I will walk you through how this process is going to work. OK, it's really a lot easier than it looks, and we will have some practice questions. If you're going to text your answers in, I do want to, it's a standard text rate message. If you have a texting plan, this won't cost you anything. If you don't, it may cost you up to about 20 cents, depending on your carrier. So the service we are using also is serious about privacy. It's poll everywhere. You can look it up online when you get the opportunity. They do not save your cell phones. They do not contact you after this survey time is over. If by chance you make a mistake when you're entering your answer, they will respond and tell you what you've done wrong in entering your answer and tell you how to correct it. So, but they won't spam you after this event is over. So to text your message, you will text the, a code. And the code we are using, I believe, is going to be 22333. I'll double check that. But you'll text a, your answer to 22333. 22333. And we are going to have a practice question before we start this. If you would prefer to use Twitter, and I have been told, if you're on Verizon, that texting works a little better in this room than uh, Twitter does. But if you do want to use Twitter, tweet your response to at poll, followed by the code that will be projected on the slide. Your followers don't see this tweet because you're beginning it with at poll, so your followers won't see it. If you would prefer to use your web browser on your phone, go to pollev.com. You'll see a box there, and you can type in your response. So again, the, we're using some uh, service that is serious about privacy. They can't see who you are. I won't know how you have voted, and you won't receive any messages outside of this survey time. <laughs> well, you'll see. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, so we're going to practice with a couple of questions and talk to those around you. We'll see how this goes. My favorite candy bar is Snickers, Charleston Chew, Kit Kat, Butterfinger. I don't like candy bars. So if you want to text, text 22333 and put in the code of the choice that you are making. If you want to tweet, start your tweet with at poll and follow it by the number of your choice. And we'll see that, here we go. What is your favorite candy bar? Snickers, Charleston Chew, Kit Kat, Butterfinger? Don't like, so if your choice is Butterfinger, put in 22333 to text and hit, and then select 248457. Type that in. Uh, put a space. Do at poll space and then the number of your selection. Some of you who have figured it out, maybe help your neighbors who are still trying to do this. Anybody need help? Give them a minute and then ask them if they need more time to raise their hands. And yeah. That. Josh, could you help this gentleman right here, please? <laughs> All right. Anybody need more time? Okay.
text to 22333, and in the message section, type in the number, the, code, the Butterfinger or KitKat or whatever. What? Okay. Something for Kim to put her. All right, we're going to, um, the good thing about doing this is if you are texting, the 22333 is the code that we will use throughout the survey. So you will not have to enter that part again. So this is the hard one. Now we're gonna do an open-ended question. Oh, I just said 22333 and it called me a liar. Okay, so if this one is an open-ended question, text 248161 is the address you're texting to, and then at the beginning, oh wait, I'm sorry, 22333 is where you're sending the text, so that is the same. At the beginning of your text message, type 248161, and then a space, and then your hometown. This takes a little longer. If you're tweeting, it's at poll space, type 248161, and then type your hometown. And, we, and um, this is live. We're not moderating the responses, so pay attention to spell check or autocorrect. <laughs> So you can see your answer scrolling down the screen. Great. Does anybody still have questions about how to use this? Raise your hand and someone will help you, I'm sure. We're gonna, I, th I think you're getting the hang of it. Um, the great thing about this survey tool is today we're gonna talk about the Young Clergy Initiative and we want to take some time to gather answers from you. So we'll be able to save these answers and refer to them in the work that, we, that GBHEM is doing on the Young Clergy Initiative. Before we get started, I'd like to invite Rena Yoakum forward. Rena is the Assistant General Secretary for Clergy Formation and Global Theological Education and she has an announcement. As a delegate to the 2012 General Conference, I can personally testify to the confusion on several issues. However, the conference was very clear about two matters. One, we are a worldwide church, and we celebrate it, and we want to learn how to live and work together more fruitfully. Second, we want to be a church with a future. And therefore, we celebrate and want to increase the engagement and nurture of young clergy. Your General Board of Higher Education and Ministry embraces both of these emphases. As a global agency for the General Church, we are ready to lead the way. I am pleased to announce two upcoming appointments to our staff. Adriano Kalinda, I think we have his photo is a young elder from West Angola Conference. For the past four years, he has served as Executive Secretary for Youth Ministries for the All Africa Conference of Churches. He will be moving to Nashville after the first of the year to become our Director for Global Formation for New Spiritual Leaders. He will work with our young seminarians, expanding that to a global network and he will also work with the new commission on Central Conference Theological Education. And now, the second announcement. I want to introduce to you the new Director of Enlistment and Formation for Young Clergy. His many assignments will include Exploration 13, implementation of the Vocational Discernment and Recruitment Networks, as well as working with the newly established Young Clergy Initiative. Now I want to tell you, you all are a privileged audience 
because this introduction this morning precedes any formal announcement of this position, although I want to assure you it has been cleared through official channels. <clears throat> but he is an elder, and he is an elder in the North Carolina Conference, a member of their Board of Ordained Ministry. He will begin his duties on January the 7th. I ask you to greet the Reverend Tripp Lowry. I've asked Tripp to uh, say a word about his background and his journey that leads him to this point so that you might know him just a little better. Thanks, Rena. I, uh, my name is Tripp. That's, it's not a, a very common name because it's a nickname, and she was asking me if I want to be introduced as James or Tripp, and uh, Tripp's the name I'll answer to. My official name is James. Uh, if you do call me Tripp, uh, if you do call me James, I'm probably going to ignore you, though. Um, because I'm not used to getting called that, and when my wife uses James, I'm usually in trouble, so it'll go ignored. Uh, some previous work that I've done, I did undergraduate work in secondary education. When I left college, I played professional soccer for a number of years and then taught public high school science and math, the whole time trying to discern um, what I was being called into and couldn't figure it out. I spoke to a local pastor, and, and he said that those were all issues I needed to work out in seminary. So <laughs> I attended uh, Duke Divinity School and, and worked out those issues um, and certainly did feel called into ordained ministry. My first um, place of service was in youth ministry, which I don't think is rare. I think we all started in youth ministry um, and then moved into local church service at a church in the Research Triangle Park. I served there, also served a local church on the Outer Banks in North Carolina and now serve a local church at least for the next month or so um, <laughs> right outside of Raleigh it's a bedroom community of Raleigh and so they're trying to live into uh, we used to be a, a coal tobacco town and now we're being overwhelmed by SAS and Cisco systems and trying to deal with all of that and uh, it's it's pretty exciting I'm supposed to tell you things that I'm excited about doing as part of this job um, it honestly learning about this job has been drinking out of a fire hose I, I get more and more and more uh, information about what it is I'm going to actually do starting in January. And it's really exciting. I'm super excited about dreaming with you guys about the future of the church. Uh, the future of the church is, is young people and moving young people into places of leadership and hearing their voice about what we're going to do and, and how we're going to accomplish these new things as the church moves forward. And I'm uh, really excited um, about helping the church grow into this this thing it's going to become and we're catching glimpses of what it's going to look like but trying to to put faces on that and, and paint real pictures of what this is going to look like is going to be a lot of fun um, I start like she, she had mentioned in January and I would love to have conversations with you here about the work that's going to start in January um, but please try to understand that, that I'm also, while trying to absorb all of this great information and wonderful um, projects that I'll be working on, I'm, I'm still trying to discern how best to explain to the United Methodist Men's uh, group at my local church how I don't want to be the donkey in the Christmas pageant. So um, <laughs> I've still got these little things I'm trying to wrestle with while trying to absorb all these big things. So uh, please feel free to come up and ask questions. Uh, do so gently gently and use small words. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. So we're going to shift now for these two sessions to focus on two critical areas of leadership development for the United Methodist Church. And the General Conference has expressly, um, in, they have an, er, uh, they have put an emphasis on the development of young adult leadership and the development of racial ethnic clergy. So before lunch, we will look more closely at the need for young adults, and then after lunch, shift our focus to a conversation on racial, eth racial ethnic clergy and immigration issues. Almost every time I talk with people in the church about the need for more young adult clergy, the question comes up, don't you care about second career clergy? Don't you care about clergy who aren't young adults? And of course, the answer is yes. All types of leadership and clergy who come from many different backgrounds and perspectives are needed. 
Without a diversity of lay and clergy leadership, the church will not thrive. However, the number and percent of young adult clergy is so critically low that the church has decided to allocate funding, programming, and other support for the purpose of increasing the number of young adults. The numbers we see here will demonstrate that need. This year's general conference elected to set aside up to $7 million for the Young Clergy Initiative. This fund is for the purpose of increasing the number of young clergy in the United States. The church has allocated these funds to focus on issues around theological education in the United Methodist tradition and to examine the discernment, recruitment, nurturing, education, and support of young clergy leaders. To best utilize these funds, the general board will work in collaboration with boards, seminaries, bishops and cabinets, agencies, and other groups that are instrumental to supporting the work of this initiative. So we do look forward today to getting some feedback from you about the best way to invest our time and resources in this initiative. Here's where we are with our current candidates. These numbers are what is currently from August 2012 reported in the online candidacy application system. We currently have 6,820 active candidates. If you'll notice by far the largest percentage, over half, are those ages 40 to 70. Now, it's promising that 18% of those candidates are under 30, but that is not a big enough percentage to significantly turn the tide. There will be attrition of those who don't complete the process for one reason or another, and a good percentage of these also will not be ordained before age 35. And additionally, local pastors and those on the ordained track for ministry both go through the candidacy process. So in active candidates, you see a percentage, there'll be a percentage of those going for licensing in local pastor ministry and those going for deacons or elders orders through ordained ministry. I'm going to move through these slides rather quickly, but this document has been posted or will be posted on the event resources page. I hope you'll take the time to look more closely at these numbers. Just over half of our total candidates are men. And still a vast majority, 69% of candidates are Caucasian, with the next largest group at 11% with African Americans. For me, this is the most powerful chart that we have right now. It's troubling. I hope you'll take the time to look more closely at it. But I want to point out that the strikingly low number of racial ethnic candidates who are younger than 30. If only 53 African American or only 32 Asian American or only 29 Hispanic candidates are younger than 30, how is our church poised to respond to the need for more diverse leadership now and into the future? Our country is more and more diverse. Our candidates are not. I could read all these numbers. You can see them listed across the bottom of the chart. This applies across the board. So if, how is our church going to be prepared to respond to more diverse people, to all types of people, if we are severely underrepresented in any area of clergy leadership? Each year, the Lewis Center for Church Leadership out of Wesley Theological Seminary releases its Clergy Age Trends Report. And the 2012 report, which also is posted on our event page, highlights that elders older than 55 are more than half of all elders. Those ages 55 to 72 continue to increase in percentage, while the middle cohort in those age, those age 35 to 54 continues to shrink. The young clergy percentage this year stayed about the same between 2011 and 2012 at about 5.6%, with a loss in the real numbers of young deacons and young elders. And keep in mind that in this report, elders and deacons refers to both those who are provisional and ordained clergy. While the number of deacons is still relatively small as compared to elders, the percentage of all young deacons consistently runs higher than that of young elders. So Dr. Kim Cape was appointed GBHEM's General Secretary in April of 2011. Through her leadership, the General Board has been given the responsibility to steward the Young Clergy Initiative Fund. She will share with us now where we are with this project and how you can be a part of this process.
Friends, before I begin, as a native Texan, we must observe a moment of silence for the passing of big Tex. <laughs> Let's open. I would like to open my remarks this morning with Tehard de Chardin's Eucharistic prayer. Let us pray. Now therefore, speaking through my lips, pronounce over this earthly travail your twofold efficacious word, the word without which all that our wisdom and our experience have built up must totter and crumble the word through which all our most far-reaching speculations in our encounter with the uni universe are come together into a unity. Over, over every living thing which is to spring up, to grow, to flower, to ripen during this day, say again the words, this is my body and over every death force which waits in readiness to corrode, to wither, to cut down, speak again your commanding words which express the supreme mystery of faith. This is my blood. Amen. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood. Teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Friends, we're delighted that you are here, and we intend to make this training time worth your time and money. As you know, the General Conference entrusted the GBHEM with implementing the Young Clergy Initiative. We fully realize the importance of this initiative for the future of the United Methodist Church and for the future of our young, gifted leaders. I am certain, beyond any doubt, that God continues to call people to ordained ministry. And I am also sure that God calls more young people to ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church that make it through the process. As you know, this directly relates to our work together. Your work as a board of ordained ministry and our general board of higher education and ministry. We are in this together. I served 12 years on the board of ordained ministry in the Southwest Texas Conference. I was chairing what is now called RIM, the then three year provisional process when I was appointed to the cabinet. As a cabinet member, I sat in DCOM meetings that took days, interviewing over 60 persons requesting candidacy or continuing candidacy. I know your job is tough. You don't hear thank you enough or ever. So Thank you, thank you for all the time, spiritual and emotional energy you invest in this leadership role on behalf of our covenant together. You will find your greatest joy and your greatest heartbreak in this work. And some humor. I have, I'm not revealing the names to protect the guilty. Uh, during one of our interviews in a Board of Ordained Ministry, uh, a rather large young clergy woman was being interviewed. And one of the older males asked her this question. Why are so many clergy women fat? And she answered, I don't know. Why are so many clergymen bald? 
Somehow I've never forgotten that. So if some of you are serving in this role for the first time, some of you are veterans and are wondering if there's anything new under the sun, trust me, there will be. Let me share with you how we are proceeding with the Young Clergy Initiative and how I hope we can work together to make this Young Clergy Initiative a positive tipping point. As we at GBHEM implement the Young Clergy Initiative, we understand that this is a complex, wicked problem. A wicked problem is one that requires more than one solution. This term, wicked problem, was originally used in social planning to describe a problem that is difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. The term wicked is not used in the sense of evil. Rather, it's resistance to resolution. Moreover, because of complex interdependencies, the effort to solve one aspect of a wicked problem may reveal or create other problems. That's a quote from Wikipedia. We can all identify wicked problems. Need an example? This young clergy initiative is one. There is no one solution that fixes this. If we miraculously made seminary free, that would not solve the issues around candidacy or itineracy. If you did away with provisional membership and ordained everybody straight out of seminary, that doesn't solve the problem for boards to evaluate new clergy's effectiveness. And oh, by the way, the Judicial Council is meeting today on security of appointment. If they uphold the elimination of security of appointment, that still doesn't solve the complexity of evaluating clergy for effectiveness or recruiting young gifted clergy or relieve Joe and Edna as SPRC members from asking for an ineffective clergy to leave. I do know that somehow we must address the issue of quality and excellence. We want to ask the best, brightest of our young people, our children and our grandchildren, to at least consider the question, is God calling you to ordained ministry? Am I on? We're going to ask a couple questions. We'll start out easy. This is a select one. When do you believe that seminary graduates should be ordained? When they receive an appointment at right after they graduate, which would mean no provisional period. When they complete one year of provisional membership. When they complete two years. Or when they complete three years of provisional membership. Take a second and answer this question. We're going to move on to the next question. Does your annual conference have a program dedicated specifically to the recruitment of young adult clergy? 
Yes, no, or you're not sure? The code for yes is 91541, for no, 91550, or not sure, 91841. And remember, if you choose not to participate on your cell phone, please do jot down your answers and give those to us at the end of the session. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is going to be a free answer question. What is the one best one? What is the one best thing? Because you have to answer in 140 characters. So. What is the one best thing your annual conference does to support young adult candidates and clergy? And you can type your answers now. Remember to put the code number in first. Text to 22333. The first thing you type is 92144, then a space, and then your answer. Same thing with Twitter or the web. What is the one best thing your annual conference does to support young adult candidates and clergy. <laughs> Provide money, mentoring groups. We've heard a lot about mentoring groups from young adults. came from Pacific Northwest, <laughs> whoever said DJ. You can continue to answer this question too. The poll will stay open through this whole session. So I'm going to move on to the next question as well. If your annual conference could do one thing to increase the number of young clergy, what would it be? Something you're not doing now, what one thing would you like to see your annual conference try now? Okay, friends, I'm sure you'll continue to do this while I talk. That's quite all right. We believe that our first task is to listen to young clergy, young people in process, and clearly hear how our present process serves the goal of helping more young people connect their call to ministry with service in the United Methodist Church. I just left the association of United Methodist Theological Schools meeting. This is a meeting of our, all our United Methodist Seminary deans. They tell me the average age is now 22 in some of our schools. They say the tide has turned and more students are now coming to seminary directly from college. They say the problem isn't <coughs> at the Excuse entry me. level. They say the problem is with boards of ordained ministry and cabinets who send young people to the ends of the earth for the first years of their ministry. We in the boards of ordained ministry probably see clearly how others contribute to this problem as well. We held a young clergy initiative summit this August with the primary purpose of listening to the young clergy 
the response was huge. There is a lot of energy around this question. We thought it was most important to listen to the young people. Some were candidates, some were in process, some were provisional members. One third were under 30, over half were under 40. And we're gonna ask you the same questions we asked them. Where do you see roadblocks? Where did you observe success with your process? What is the one thing you would change? If you could change one thing, what would it be? Now we're asking you. So the first question we're going to answer now, or ask you to give us some input, is what is the biggest roadblock for the young adults you know who are trying to enter ministry today? Is it the candidacy and ordination process? Is it, the sem is it seminary expenses? What about annual conference support? The itinerancy or other? In our next question, you'll have the time to explain your answers a little bit. Okay, has everybody gotten their answers in? Okay. Now, do you have any additional comments? For those of you who said other, what would you say the other is? If you said something about the candidacy, the ordination process, what might that be? Um, just a chance to expand on your answer a little bit if you want to. Thank you. All right, well, we're receiving these answers, I'm going to push us to the next question, which again is a select one answer. What was the most helpful thing in your candidacy process? Was it meeting with your candidacy mentor? Was it the resources that you received from DCOM or the Board of Ordain Ministry? Was it a chance to meet with your peers during the provisional period or seminary support and scholarships that you received or other? board of ministry line keeps getting smaller. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then any other additional comments that you have about your answer on that last question? We'll, we'll make, yeah, we'll get a document that shows what the answers were. It'll take us a few days to do that, but we'll post them, yes. All right. Here they come. Yikes. <laughs> a 
Okay. Some of the responses we heard were, what about the young people who never got to this stage because of roadblocks? One of the participants wrote me recently, and I quote, my lingering concern is one that I stated while we were together. What about young people who choose never to enter candidacy, who are indeed called to and gifted for ordained ministry? I can name at least five and probably closer to ten whom I worked with in college while I was a chaplain there. Their reasons for never entering candidacy were as varied as their vocations. Fundamentally, I believe that each of them has or will find ways to live out their vocation beyond ordained ministry and or the United Methodist Church. My grief is for the church's loss in not having them among us as clergy leaders. What are some of the things that prevent bright young people from considering the idea of ordained ministry? Well, one thing is the stress of being $50,000 in debt on a $30,000 a year salary. We followed up by structuring our conversations around the issues of nurture, education, recruitment, discernment, and support. Nerds helps you remember it. Nurture, education, recruitment, discernment, support. This is not about tweaking the candidacy process. The General Conference has already asked GBHEM to set up a task force on clergy debt, which we are doing even as we speak. The other thing that we learned is that while many young people are hearing the call to ordain ministry, they are not connecting the call to ordain ministry with service in an annual conference. Unlike my generation, which connected the call to being sent to a local church by a bishop in a cabinet, that is not as clear a path today. Instead of the, here I am, send me, wherever you need me, in parenthesis, today's young people are saying, here I am. Show me how ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church fulfills my call. It is now up to us to make the case that ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church is the best way to answer God's call. We invite young people to be part of something global, a ministry that connects personal devotion with social justice, a ministry that values and invites the contributions of women as well as men. Next question. How does your board of ordained ministry or the process that you use in your annual conference need to change to address this kind of question? It's a legitimate question. What is your answer to this wicked question? problem. If we could rebuild the candidacy and ordination process from scratch, what would you eliminate first? Sometimes it's easier to talk about the things you don't like, right? Provisional membership, seminary debt, one-year candidacy requirement, candidacy mentoring, other. And like the other questions, do you have additional comments that you'd like to say about that?
Okay. And then what would you like to see district committees and boards of ordained ministry do to support young adult candidates and clergy? As Kim alluded to, it's very easy to look and say what other groups should be doing, but we want you to reflect a little bit about what you could be doing to support young adult candidates and clergy. The last question in this section, estimate about what percentage of your candidates attend a United Methodist Seminary. Less than 25%, 26 to 50, 51 to 75, over 75, or you're not sure. This is just a guess based on the people you see coming through your board. As Meg said, we will be sharing these, uh, these results with you. A conversation with bright, gifted young people. A conversation means they talk, we listen. We talk, they listen. That's a conversation. We ask questions and we listen to the answers. For our part, we must ask the question of them, can you do the job? And we need to make it clear what they are saying yes or no to. One thing that I think is vital for our side of the conversation is that we must have our act together. We all know that we have approved and ordained people we should not have. He is marginal, let's give him a chance. She's working on her issues. He heard the call when he was 10, but now he's 70. <laughs> Did I mention that in one of my experiences along the way, a young person came seeking elders orders and no, oh, by the way, in the conversation, told me about addiction to pornography? Sometimes no is the best answer. Best for the person, best for the church, sometimes no is the kindest answer. Jesus himself said no on many occasions. Which leads us to the question, how do we define effectiveness? We will spend three hours on this very question. But the last question I want to ask you today is how do we best use the General Conference investment of $7 million that will produce the desired outcome of more competent, committed young clergy? How do we use this investment as a positive tipping point for the United Methodist Church? We have two questions that we want to close with. What do you say when someone asks you why they should serve in the United Methodist Church?
Remember, this is not moderated. I know. And the final question is, other than funding existing programs or events, what is the best investment of the Young Clergy Initiative Fund? If you had $7 million to spend on Young Clergy Initiative, We will look through these and, and uh, definitely give you the feedback we received. One more thing, just one more thing. In the Gerasene demoniac story, y'all remember that in Mark 5, the healed man wants to come with Jesus and the disciples. He begs Jesus to come with him. And think about it, if there was ever a walking, talking, living example of Jesus' power, it's this guy. Come see the man who was running around naked among the tombs. Come see the scars where he broke his shackles. Listen to him talk about his demonic possession. No. Jesus said, no. Jesus said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. Listen to me. He had no friends. He's been running around naked howling in the tombs. He doesn't have friends. Jesus is saying, start over. You will have friends. Being healed doesn't mean that you are called to be an apostle. Not all who hear the cry, call of Christ are called to ordain ministry. We know this. Don't approve somebody for ordained ministry because they are a sweet person and love Jesus. Exercise tough love from the start. Ask yourself, would I want this person to be my son's pastor or my grandson's pastor? And I say my son or grandson's pastor because we can really only reach people 20 years younger and 20 years older than we are. 
I am 60 years old. My limits are clear. We must ask, could this person lead anyone anywhere? If not, kindly say to them, the call of Christ is very strong. And certainly, you have heard it. But Christ calls people to serve as laity too. And that's the best direction to follow the call you are hearing. That is the kindest thing you can do for that person in the church. People who don't have a strong prayer life find this hard because they don't have confidence in their discernment of spiritual gifts. Wesley said, shall we send the dead to raise the dead? Don't ordain somebody because you think it would help them with their esteem issues. <laughs> Remember, as a resurrection people, there is a moment when God acts. The tide turns. The demons leave. The possessed are free and the blind see. What if we came to ourselves? What if we came to our right minds and said, Jesus, show us our spiritual children. What must we become so that these might find their life's vocation? If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood. Teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Amen. Amen. We are going to break now for lunch. The work of the Young Clergy Initiative is being funneled through the Office of the General Secretary at GBHEM, and the email address is up there if you would like to be in more conversation about this initiative. Um, we get comments often about the need to discern ministry for laity and ordained ministry. Those are equal in both valid calls to ministry in the United Methodist Church. This fund has been directed by us by the General Conference to be focused on young clergy leadership development. So while many of the programs at GBHEM do focus on lay leadership, this one is focused on clergy. There's been some questions about that, so I did want to just mention that. Rena is going to close us in prayer, and we will return back into this room for our plenary session after lunch. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we give you thanks as we gather around these tables, even as we lift to you those persons who have neither food nor tables. We give you thanks for the food that will nourish our bodies and the hands that have made this meal possible. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts to you, even as we extend our hands to one another. We pray in the name of the one whose presence was made known in the breaking of bread. Amen. <laughs>